And the whole church said, Amen. 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 I, say that. I say that at Mayfair, but I think you say it better than they do. Say it again. And the whole church said, Amen. 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 I'm like Lee Mollum. I'm ready to go home. <laughs> but that's what I want to talk about this morning. There's no place like home. I love homecoming. I love homecomings because it just fires up something in our hearts about home. Uh, Lee's right, that is one of my favorite songs, Church, Get Right, and Let's Go Home. One of the most powerful and greatest things said in God's Word is when the prodigal said, I will arise and go to my father's house. Amen? Amen. The good thing about being a Christian is we have three homes. Uh, we've got our family home. Thanks, Tim, for that remark about being married so long. At least, at least I didn't marry my daughter. I've been wanting to say that for a long time. So we have our family home. We talk about going home, you, you might say, well, my home's not what it ought to be. But we don't talk about somebody whose home wasn't what it should. He had a hateful brother. And so we have our family home. And then thank God we have our church home. Yes, yes. I say all the time at Mayfair, what in this world would we do if we didn't have something? We just couldn't make it. We just couldn't make it. The devil has just beaten us up all week long. He never takes a vacation. He always hits us when we're down. And then when, he, when we come together on the Lord's day, he ain't got to pray. Because we're together. And when we're together, we're strong. And when we're together, we're more determined to do God's will than ever before. And so we have our church home. And is it perfect? No, pray not. Not long, not as long as it's made up of folks like me and you. We kind of mess it up every day. But before the night is over, we've said, Lord, forgive me. I need your help. If you give me another day tomorrow, I'll try not to do that again. I'll be better because I'm holding to your hand. And not only do we have our family home, our church home, but thank God we've got a heavenly home. This world is not our home. We're just passing through. There are more songs written by home. There are more poems written by home about being at home and there's nothing like and doesn't matter where you go there's nothing like being at home and i think the prodigal son realized that when he said in verse 17 and when he came to himself you see because in the bible christianity is described as coming home and if you are with god you're at home if you're with God, you've already made that journey out of a far country into the place God wants you to be. You've been redeemed. You've been bought with a great price. You have prayed. You have been uh, taken advantage of that sacrifice that was made for you. And so then the prodigal son said, and said of him, and he came to himself. Let's think about that 15th chapter of Luke. Open your Bibles there because... I think that has the power to change lives. It has the power to change Christians. I must personally confess that it's had a profound influence on my life recently, or in the last three or four years. I had a young man come into my office and told me he was thinking about killing the passion to have enough influence that we can share the word with our family and friends. They're the ones we ought to have credibility with. They're the ones we ought to have influence over. If we're living it, wow. You see, Christianity 
the acid test, the real test of Christianity is not a church. We're good folks at church. Amen? The real acid test of Christianity is at home. And so the prodigal son said, I will arise and go to my father's house. And he'll tell him, I'm, not no, I'm no more worthy to be called his son, but make me as one of the hired servants. You see, that's what a far country will do. A far country will, will strip you of every bit of pride you ever had. A far country will cause you to think that you're not worthy of the Lord. That, that, that hasn't happened in a long time, but I used to talk to some people who would say, when I'd invite them to come to worship with me, and they'd say, oh, oh no, I, I can't do that. The, the building would fall in if I were to come in. No, I promise you it won't. I promise you if you'll come, if you'll find your church home, you'll be glad, and, you'll, you'll be, and you will find that unconditional love. It's hard for us to fathom that because... We depend so much upon, if you're nice to me, I'm nice to you. If you curse me, I'll curse you. If you gossip about me, I'll gossip about you. It's so difficult to find that unconditional love. <coughs> Timothy McVeigh, you remember him? He blew up the building in Oklahoma City. I was there. In fact, I was talking on the phone to the preacher. Jeff Jenkins was a preacher there, and I was supposed to go there for a revival. And it was 9 o'clock on that Thursday morning, and he and I were on the phone, and we heard this awful boom. And I said, Jeff, what was that? He said, oh, that's the air conditioning that kicks on every once in a while, making a racket. So we talked on about the revival, that I'd be there in a couple of weeks, and we hung up. And then his secretary walked in and said, turn on the television. There have been hundreds of people killed downtown. Timothy McVeigh was caught a short time after by a highway patrolman that stopped him about a traffic violation. But it was during his trial, and all those horrible pictures and all those horrible things were said, and all those horrible accusations which were true, Timothy's father was there. And he stood by his father and his son. And he told his son he loved him. But a reporter stuck a microphone in his face. The father he said, how could you do that? He said, because he's my boy. He's my boy. Listen, there's a difference between accepting people and approving what they do. Amen? Amen? You accept people because Jesus died for them. You got that? Amen. You accept people because Jesus died for them. Uh -huh. And in God's sight, they are just as important as you are. Now, do you approve of their decisions? No. Do you approve of the way they live their life? No. Do you? Here's a kicker. Do you love them enough to tell them? in love. Paul said in Ephesians 4.15, preach the truth in love. And so then the prodigal son wanted to go home. He came to his senses because what did he realize? He realized that he had unconditional love. It, you know, it's so interesting. He had his little speech in the hog pen. And then when he saw his father, the father saw him. Have you ever longed truly long to see people come home. I mean, really, that it was a daily thing. I think the Bible doesn't say for sure, but I really think the Father looked down that road every single solitary day, hoping his baby boy would come home. And finally, that day came. And he did something that you don't do in those days. It's something that you don't read about in the scriptures. Uh, you do read about it in scripture, but not in any other example. The Bible says, and the father ran to him. Yeah. When will the father run? When prodigals come home. Every time. 
the Lord will meet you more than halfway. And if you long for that heavenly home, you start off with this home. You start off with the church home. Because in Acts 2.47, and the Lord added to the church daily such as were being saved. And so then he found unconditional love when he got home. Not only that, but he found something he had lost in the hog pen. His identity. He didn't know who he was. He took a job. The, the people that he worked for would rather the pigs be fed than him. The Bible said he would have gladly. Now, I'm from Alabama. Do y'all know what slop is? Okay. Come on now. Do you know what slop is? That's slop. He would have gladly filled his belly with the husk of the swine pit eat. You ever been that hungry? I don't think I have. I hope I never get that hungry. But he lost his identity. He lost his friends. They left. Watch it now. They left when the money left. Have you noticed that? That he spent his money, his money in his, his inheritance, in righteous living. He lost his friends. He lost everything he had. And he said, I don't have to sit here. My, my dad has slaves better off than I have. He said, they, I love this statement. He said, they have bread enough and to spare. Wow. And I'm eating slop. What's, what's wrong with that picture? Why did I leave a perfect... You know, I think he left because, Dad, I'm tired of your rules. I'm tired of your regulations. I'm tired of you telling me how to live my life. He thought he could make it on his own. I don't need you. I don't need my older brother. I can make it by myself. It scares me when Christians, regardless of their struggles in life, think they can make it on their own. There are no long rangers in the Lord's church. You may be one, but you're walking on dangerous territory. You can't make it by yourself. And so he said, I will arise and I will go to my father's house and tell him I'm no more worthy than to call his son, but make me as one of thy hired sons. Put me on the back 40. I don't want to walk down Main Street with you. I'm too embarrassed. Sin will strip you of every identity you ever had. It'll cut you to the bone. And he said, Dad, I, I just I just don't think I can face you and everybody else. And, you know, what's on, when you read the story, brothers and sisters, the father didn't even let him finish. He turned to a servant and said, bring, no, I, and I, I don't think I've ever seen this. He said, bring the best robe. See, he lost his identity. He came home in rags. See, when you come to your church home, we come in rags. Because we're not worthy. In that we've done anything to save ourselves. For by grace have you been saved through faith. That out of itself. He says, lest any man should boast. Right. Nobody can boast of saving themselves. you got to come to the Father's house. Yeah. Okay. And so he said, I will arise and go to my Father's house. And then the Father said, get the best robe. Notice he didn't tell the servant where the best robe was. <coughs> he knew where it was. Amen. Because it was his. Yeah. Bring my robe. He traded some old dirty, filthy rags for a robe of righteousness. Does that sound familiar? Isn't that true? Today we put the Lord on in baptism. And we came up out of that watery grave. And we have traded some old dirty, filthy rags of sin for a robe of righteousness.